Welcome to the Ortho Joe Show, a joint production of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Ortho Evidence. In our world, orthopedic research is king, and current topics from our respective publications are analyzed weekly. Here is Mohit Bhandari from Ortho Evidence and Mark Swinkowski from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Well, good morning, Mo. Morning. It is an absolutely beautiful morning here in Minnesota. We've had about two weeks of uh, 70s and 80s with relatively low humidity. And now I understand why I lived through six months of shoveling snow. So uh, <laughs> well, I'm it's, on it's cam- beautiful here. I'm on campus in very sunny Southern Ontario, McMaster University. And it's actually, it's nice. We've had some rain, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. rain does does go away and the sun does shine. So here we are today. Yeah. Well, what's on your mind from uh, OE's perspective? Yeah. You know, I mean, from time to time, obviously, you know, we like to highlight large trials and, you know, however we define what a large trial is in surgery, I would tell you that probably a decade ago, a large trial would have been about a hundred patients, but we've seen more and more collaboratives. You and I have certainly engaged in numerous collaboratives. Um, And this one particular collaborative was called the insight trial, but functionally a large trial of over 700 patients randomized across multiple international centers, led by Professor Emil Shemich and a number of other European investigators. I was also on the team, published in JAMA Open. We did an an advanced clinical evidence report on this and had a short interview with uh, Emil on this topic. The principle here is, is, and again, to many of our our viewers and listeners, intermedullary nailing versus sliding hip screw in trochanteric fracture management. And this was called the Insight Randomized Trial. And I, I think you know the answer, but you know, if for those of you who are thinking, just think, what do you think the answer is, right? Would an intramedullary nail versus a sliding hip screw, knowing what you already know in your practices, show some benefit? Now, the argument has always been, and the rationale for the trial was, you know, when the both stable and unstable fractures, except the reverse oblique, so you know, the, those are excluded, but the, really the stable and unstable fracture patterns, intertrochanteric patterns. The perception and the belief was that, well, an intramedullary nail would provide early functional recovery. I mean, that was the perception uh, that we were testing. And so we looked at a number of quality of life assessments and functional measures, as well as the standard, you know, complication profile. As it turned out, there was no difference in any of those measures at follow-up. And ultimately, no difference in health-related quality of life or the Euroqual 5D, which you're well aware of, uh, at one year. And all of the revisions and fracture adverse events, patient mobility measures really functionally weren't uh, that different. So in a large clinical trial, uh, we are left once again with the conclusion that there is no difference between two treatments. The question that I ask you, uh, Mark, from this is, Knowing what you know on this topic, and certainly your vast history with both implants as well as trials and this particular problem, do we need yet another trial following Insight? Would Insight be the last trial we need, knowing now that we have about several thousand patients across multiple randomized trials that have principally suggested the same thing? Well, I really do not think we need another trial. As you've mentioned, there's probably three, 4,000 in each arm. If you do the meta-analysis on all the trials, I think they're, the number's up to 25 or 26 RCTs on this uh, subject. So I don't see a need for further trials. The numbers are adequate. The, the, the question is, why hasn't behavior changed? And why do we see, when I examine for uh, the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, I see young surgeons who use exclusively IM nails Many have never even put in a sliding hip screw in their training. So why aren't people following the evidence is, is I think the broader question here. Mo, what what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I mean, there is this knowledge to evidence gap and one would argue that, you know, any large body of evidence requires a few years, maybe even longer to actually get into, you know, get into guidelines, et cetera. You can't use that argument here. That's the problem. I mean, we have you know 25 randomized trials and I mean, trial after trial after trial has said fundamentally the same thing. I believe there are even authors on this paper that feel that you know us not including the reverse oblique fractures was a mistake, right? And that we should have included them and really just said once and for all said, there is a lower cost alternative yeah. that can give you the exact same outcome or similar outcomes. And so it does lead to a bit of a, a 
a quandary as to why. Now, I suspect we can think broadly as there could be issues of remuneration. I mean, you know, around, you know, one cost more. Now, in our, in our healthcare system in Canada, I can tell you, you know, there is one price, right? There is one, one, you know, so what we get, so for us, if from the perspective of if all costs being equal, yeah. are people are more likely to use a nail or a sliding hip screw. And I would still tell you that there's a lot more people using an IM nail than a sliding hip screw. And I think it gets back to just training. I think more programs have just instituted this, this so residents and trainees get comfortable with an approach and will continue to use that approach as the, you know, for all, for all for all treatments, you know, if it if it works regardless of cost, if cost doesn't become prohibitive. So in some places uh, it is prohibitive, and therefore they move to you know a sliding hip screw. But I can tell you that I don't think what's happening in Canada is probably any different than the U.S. I do think cost is a big driver, and remuneration is likely a big driver, largely based on some of the work I think that you have done, and and I was participating in some years ago with with one of your collaborators. Right. In the States, there used to be a differential as far as a RVU rate, you know, or remuneration to the surgeon based on intramedullary implant versus a hip screw, but that was corrected about 12, 14 years ago. So there's no financial advantage. And as you mentioned, uh, Mary Forty is a colleague who yes. is a real expert in the use of the Medicare database. And what she was able to identify is that there are distinct patterns where IM nails are preferential that are around trauma centers. And uh, the conclusion from that work is that what's happening is that young, younger trauma attendings at trauma centers uh, attend courses where the use of intramedullary nails are emphasized and people are still talking about the mythical, less invasive, lower blood loss, which is not true, faster return to function, which is not true based on the trials. So the influence really is coming from the educational environment, which is unfortunately, I think, heavily influenced by industry. So that's what we really have to face is honestly face this as a profession. We really shouldn't be ignoring the best scientific evidence. I can't think of another question in orthopedic trauma that has this amount of evidence that is so clear, yet we continue to ignore it. I think we need to deal with this. I think you're absolutely right. And I do think, you know, it begins with, you know, a number of, you know, large of the associations getting podiums on this, getting speakers to start talking about the evidence in a meaningful way, getting guidelines, but it's still not an easy road. I mean, you're seeing it here very obviously, right? It's, it's going to be a, a longer road ahead, but I do think now the evidence is sufficiently strong that we should be moving in a direction where we start really I would say putting some degree of, of pressure on our, you know, on our governing bodies and uh, to use evidence uh, to think about it being included in guidelines. And I think this probably this particular trial should be added to an updated systematic review where we can actually start using it uh, yes. a bit more yeah. profoundly uh, and moving in that direction. The one point I will just say to end on this uh, on this part of the segment too, Mark, is you mentioned you know how much industry drives you know usage, and I totally uh, fully agree with that. It's particularly interesting that this trial was fundamentally almost singularly funded by a large industry provider mm-hmm. in which the results, quite frankly, are would be perceived as negative, right? Mm-hmm. So in that respect, you know, I, I do want to also and you know give support and you know, and I think uh, congratulations um, to the group here led by Emil to make you know to have sure that there was going to be an opportunity to publish this work in a collaborative way. But ultimately, you know, as they write here, yeah, you know, this is a negative trial, and this does ultimately, you know, help challenge this dogma that the intramedullary nail is the, you know, preferred uh, treatment option for this particular fracture type. Right. Well, I I hope we will face the evidence, as it is said, for 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 once and for like all. Now. And I look forward to that updated analysis. So, uh, from the journal's perspective, I want to switch topics completely to an area where we just have, we have emerging evidence. Uh, Jay Parvisi's group in uh, Philadelphia has uh, published in the journal a a fascinating uh, manuscript on the microbiome of arthritic joints. And what they did in a very rigorous protocol is they, they took the surgical material from hip and knee replacement and then did very highly advanced microbe detection methodology and basically showed 
that there is a large percentage of cases that have evidence of microbes uh, in these joints. And it, of course, brings up the question, could osteoarthritis be an infectious process? And there aren't any answers uh, from this manuscript, of course. And the commentary, which was published with it, is, is very strong in pointing out that there is no direct linkage here and where the microbial genetic information might be coming from, uh, that it's not clear that it's, it's causative in any way, shape, or form. It could be contaminants, et cetera. But boy, it's an interesting theory. Uh, and uh, I just, I hearken back to the days when I was in surgical training and, you know, we all, we all thought that uh, gastric ulcers, uh, duodenal ulcers were, were related to the, the pH environment of the upper GI tract. And lo, lo and behold, it's really due to an infection of heliobacteria, period. And I, I believe that the investigator got the Nobel Prize uh, for that. Um, so anyway, what, what are your thoughts on this emerging information? Uh, yeah, this, it, yeah I think, the, yeah, the first thing always goes, and I always say, you know, to congratulate any investigative team that's really starting to think and use technology uh, in a way that can, you know, help elucidate uh, findings for other things. So for example, you know, using these new techniques and then bringing it to, you know, a problem that we haven't seen it before. The challenge is when you get findings, are they spurious? Is it chance? Are they, like, you know, I think in the commentary that I also really enjoyed reading, I loved reading the paper as well, you know, talked about, you know, do, do fragments represent the actual, you know, micro uh, yeah. of itself, right? So there's a lot of questions, you know, often more questions than answers, but at the same point in time, it does help us start thinking about in a broader way, you know, uh, about how we can be, you know, addressing these issues. And you're absolutely right. The microbiome in the body is just a whole, you know, it's, it's a whole ecosystem that we have to ultimately <laughs> start thinking about for all of our issues. I also, um, when I looked carefully at the, uh, you know, at the conclusions and the results, you know, the interest point also that they identified in this particular study around corticosteroid injections also being a potential factor, Correct. you yeah. know, made me also think about, okay, you know, and also setting that timeline around, you know, what other things are we introducing outside of, you know, the hospital environment being a potential factor that could be associated with what type of, you know, uh, microbes were identifying, but also the fact that they had had a prior corticosteroid injection, I think they had said six months. The, the point here being is that we have to continue to look carefully at everything we're doing um, in total joint replacement, because the truth of the matter is, you know, whether we have a 1% or a 1.5% or less than 1% risk of infection, it's a devastating consequence. Yes probably the one consequence that we should be spending a lot of, of resource and time and energy trying to sort out. So obviously Dr. Previzi has spent a lifetime continuing to help find solutions for this, you know, for this very difficult and negative outcome. But we should, in my mind, be thinking about, you know, some of the, even the simpler things, right, that we can be doing to limit infection. Uh, this is gonna go a long way though. And you can see how I have very tactfully, Mark, said a lot without saying anything and you can see how it's done here. This, is, this is years of my you know, my uh, life as a, as, as a mentor to many master's graduate students who leave more confused and then they come to my office yeah yeah the only thing that's missing <laughs> is the pipe uh, the pipe i'm missing the pipe and the monocle yeah. and the cake yeah. you know sure and I, I think i'm there and give me three more years and i i think you'll see me wandering around campus but no, jokes aside i i think it's an amazing approach. And I do think we have to be thinking more carefully about what we do and reevaluating the simple things, right? I mean, re, like the idea of putting um, an invasive, you know, a, an injecting before a thing is still something we haven't really quite resolved. And that in itself may be introducing and changing the environment, right? So these are all things we just have to be testing and, and good on them and kudos on them for starting this work and getting more people thinking about it. Right. Well, I, I will just uh, point out uh, to the listening audience that uh, there was some debate about whether or not we should publish this uh, manuscript. And one of the roles I feel uh, for a journal is to publish things that is going to stimulate further research. And I think uh, this is really well done work. It doesn't provide any answers, but I do believe quite strongly that it's going to really provoke a lot of research using this technology of assessing microbial fragments to try to figure out ways to change surgical preps uh, that you brought up the issue of prior injections 
it, it, are these uh, evidence of microbes present when there's been no injection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think we're going to really see a lot of research uh, using this technology to try to better understand the potential influence on the risk of, of PJI, which, as you point out, is devastating economically and, and, and health-wise and higher mortality, et cetera, et cetera. It's a real bad problem that Jay and his colleagues have been working on for decades. Yeah, and I noted also that, you know, to do this work, you know, is, is I'm certainly not uh, inexpensive as well. And I think in the hundred or so patients that they evaluated, you know, uh, we should be thinking about some of these very large collaborative programs now that are going to be recruiting patients with total knee and total hip replacement for a whole host of other, you know, um, of treatments and really starting to build in, um, you know, sub studies that can help and make these sorts of studies more efficient and everything has to happen on a large scale. I mean, the, yeah. the issue of, of cardiovascular disease didn't get solved with siloed small right. studies. It, it, it got solved with multinational collaborations, the collaborations of the type we absolutely yeah. uh, can see and have seen um, in uh, reconstructive surgery. So I, I, you know, we should be thinking about this. Anyone listening who's thinking about these sorts of issues should be thinking about how do we collaborate on a much larger scale to ensure we can validate these findings or refute them, I guess, but hopefully validate. Great point. And it comes full circle because I think the issue with intertrochanteric fractures and which device is superior has been answered. So let's hope that we can end that, uh, close that circle for, for this particular line of investigation in our yeah. lifetimes. That, that Absolutely. Would be Absolutely. Now it's time for knowledge translation on that. Yeah. And, and promoting some practice change. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to use some uh, caffeine in my Ortho Joe mug to help think about these topics further. So have a good day, Mo. You too. I, I hope you don't have too many administrative meetings today. I don't. I don't. I'm just going to just, just look out my window and stare. Like, you know, but back in the day, you know, Plato and Socrates, I am not Plato and Socrates, but I just <laughs> stare out. I just want to stare out and just think. Think. Yeah. That's all I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, you got the right pose. Yeah. <laughs> with the, the, the hand on the chin. You're, I like you're that. Set. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy. All righty. Cheers.